Hello, Dr. Sims. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing well, thanks. I really appreciate you coming on. I was doing an overview of my few years of this podcast so far, and I noticed that episode 26, which was our previous episode, was one of the top episodes listened to. Wow, cool. Yeah. Let's so, make this one top that one. <laughs> yeah. So people care, obviously. And, you know, the information that you're bringing is clearly invaluable. Um, but today's topic, we're actually talking about menopause, which is um, all about your new book, Next Level, which is amazing. I've read it front and back, and I'm now even going back and rereading certain sections. But I know that there's going to be people who are listening who maybe are not even approaching menopause or they're, you know, not thinking about it yet. Um, so I want to stop those people to let them know that they should still tune in, um, to that. Yes. So are there things that if someone isn't even in menopause that they can start doing now to help make this transition easier? Yeah. Cause I mean, like menopause is that scary word still people put it in their head. Oh, it's a uh, golden girls, old, old people. But if we're looking at <laughs> women who are, um, in their mid twenties in, in their thirties, and it's really far away from what they're thinking, it's putting the eye to, it happens to everyone. We all go through it. And if you have more information and you know what to expect, then you can put steps into place as you're starting to get into your early 40s so that you're not suddenly slammed with a whole bunch of body composition changes, mood, irritability, gut issues, all that kind of stuff. So when we're talking about it with the eye to aging, we know that women don't age in a linear fashion like men do. So it's not going to be a stepwise progression because women get hit with perimenopause somewhere in their 40s and people don't really know how to explain it. Sometimes it can be earlier, sometimes it's a little bit later. But if we're in our mid-20s to early 30s, knowing that if we start changing to do more power training and we start looking at polarizing our training, then when we actually get to the point where our hormones are changing the ratios and we're hitting perimenopause, our bodies are already primed to take on that stress and to adjust and to adapt to that stress. Um, and I think that's kind of the misstep when we're seeing all the stuff that's in the fitness information where we still have this big press for, um, you know, the eight to 15 rep range and hypertrophy training and doing long, slow stuff or uh, high intensity after high intensity day after high intensity day. And you can get away with it when you're younger. But if you start to have a plan and a scope and you can change it up as you go, but really going, OK, well, we know that women based on female physiology do better with power training. And we're not going to get all bulky because for the most part, women don't eat enough. <clears throat> and we know that as we're doing power training, we're going to um, maintain that integrity of that, that neuromuscular stimulus from muscle contraction, which is what we start to lose when we start losing those hormones. So it's just having an eye and, and a careful thought about what kind of training you're doing, even when, if you're really far away from the aspects of being peri or postmenopause. Because then again, that sets you up for success when you actually get that. Mm -hmm. So this really just aligns with your, your whole message of working with your physiology, which I think is so important. And it's this concept that, you know, really, I think empowers women, right, to understand that, you know, a big thing message you also carried on through the book is, you know, when your hormones are changing during this time of menopause, that you don't have to let that um, control your life and change who you are and, you know, how you want to live your life and, and let that bring you down. So you mentioned some of those symptoms like insomnia, you know, irritability, mood changes, um, digestive disturbances. So what exactly is happening during menopause? So I'll, I'll do a brief little, um, like terminology set so we can have everyone on the same page. When we talk about menopause, it's actually one day on the calendar. So we can say it's a, it's a birthday for the rest of your life. So menopause itself marks 12 months of no periods. The time preceding that is called perimenopause. And we know it could be anywhere, uh, it could be 10 years, it could be four years. Some people might be in it and not really realize they're in it till the three years before actually menopause hits. And then after menopause is postmenopause, which is a new biological change and, and that's your, your state for the rest of your life. So when we're looking at what's happening in perimenopause, we are starting to see a change in the ratio of estrogen and progesterone. So we might have more anovulatory cycles. So we're not having as much progesterone. We might um, 
have a lengthening of our menstrual cycle, so then we aren't exposed to as much estrogen and progesterone, or we might end up with shorter cycles. So it all has to do with what's happening with the ratios of estrogen and progesterone. And because these hormones affect every system of the body, then we really start to see impacts on our mood. We see impacts on our cardiovascular system, our muscle, our skeletal muscle, um, and our skeletal system itself. Um, we see gut disturbances, we see um, insomnia, we see changes in HRV, we see changes in our sleep architecture. And a lot of times if you go to your GP, they go, oh, well, you're just that, you're in that point of, of your life where you're very highly stressed and you look at ways to mitigate this stress. Because most of the time women in their early to mid forties, they might have younger kids or teenage kids and older adults, they might be reaching the peak of their career. So there's a lot of lifestyle stress that adds to this. But it's not that lifestyle stress that's causing all these issues. It's a change of these hormones that is really the root cause of so many people's symptoms and, and the wonderment of what is going on. Why is my training not working for me? Why can't I sleep? Why am I so irritable? Why all of a sudden am I getting these depressive swings in my mood? And again, it comes back to those hormones. Mm -hmm. And so people that are even in their menstruating years, right? So their, you know, twenties, thirties should also be paying attention to these symptoms. So if your hormones just generally are in balance for, you know, whatever reason, whether it's, you know, improper training and fueling or, you know, so many other external factors like gut imbalance and whatnot, um, you can have these types of symptoms. I think that's a really good highlight too, the, you know, perimenopause, but also just knowing that impact that those hormones fluctuating can have on your whole body system. Yeah, especially when we're talking about sleep architecture and mood, regardless of where you are in your hormone profile, estrogen has a, a complete relation to sleep architecture and mood. So we know that right before ovulation, we have that surge in estrogen and a temperature drop, and you actually have better sleep, and you have more slow wave sleep, and you have better REM sleep. Then after ovulation, core temperature starts to come up, progesterone starts to come up, you have changes in your sleep architecture. So you have less of the reparative sleep, but also your mood changes because estrogen crosses the brain barrier and it um, can affect serotonin and dopamine. So when you have ele elevation in estrogen and you have this hypersensitization of serotonin, and then all of a sudden the estrogen drops, then you have a serotonin quote, dump or a, a really rapid decrease in serotonin, which can cause anxiety and depression. So we see this in women who have um, a little bit of premenstrual disorder with regards to um, the psychological aspect in their natural cycles. We see women who come off the pill, all of a sudden they might start having some of these issues and we definitely see it in perimenopause. And again, it has to do with the ratios of your hormones. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's very helpful to know. Um, so in terms of hormone replacement therapy, one of the questions that we got was, is hormone replacement therapy recommended during perimenopause? So the thing with hormone replacement therapy is we want to change the, the terminology to menopause hormone therapy, because we don't want people to think that we're replacing hormones. Mm. It's the same as using an oral contraceptive pill. We're not replacing our hormones. We're trying to change the system a bit, but just the same as OCs cause our bodies to respond differently. So does menopause hormone therapy. It is a therapy, therapy to be used in conjunction with lifestyle change. And it's definitely an option for women who have significant vasomotor symptoms, really severe mood issues, um, vaginal dryness, uh, you know, problems with having a normal daily life. But we don't look to hormone therapy for changes in body composition because we know that it doesn't help with muscle integrity. It doesn't help with the, the serial uh, fat gain or the changes and shifts in our body composition. And it doesn't help with bone density unless you're using an estrogen patch. Hmm. If you are having a severity of symptoms where you're like, I just, I, I just can't function. Like I have so much brain fog, I have all these things, then definitely talk to your physician about it, but it's not the go-to. Okay. Because again, you still have to think about how am I going to change my training and nutrition to also benefit me in this time period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's move towards that. So there, there is this powerful tool that we have that is, is 
diet and exercise. Um, and I know you're a big proponent of, you know, strength training, lifting heavy, but especially during or after menopause, right? You mentioned mm-hmm. how it's really important to not just, you know, do those like really high repetitions. You're talking like low weight, low repetitions to really maintain that muscle mass, that lean muscle mass during this time. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So when we get into this time period where where our ratios are changing, and like I said, all of our systems are affected, we want to look at how we can stress the body to create an adaptation the way these hormones used to do for us. So if we look at estrogen, for example, it's women's testosterone. So it is an anabolic steroid that's responsible for really helping us with muscle protein synthesis, specifically um, the actin filament within muscle contraction. So you have actin and mycin, or sorry, the mycin filament, not the actin filament, the mycin filament. So you have mycin and, and actin that come together and kind of overlap to actually create a contraction. So when estrogen starts to be perturbed, um, you have issues with the mycin filament. So you lose some of the integrity and the signaling for it to do what it needs to do. If we're looking at how do we support that, if we're doing heavy lifting, it's a neuromuscular stimulus. It's not a cardiovascular stimulus. So we're looking at a nerve coming down and trying to recruit as many fibers as possible to create a contraction that's going to overcome that heavy load. And if you are lifting heavy and you're repeatedly stressing the body under that heavy load, it learns that that neural signal. So you're going to get the signal and and maintain that myosin integrity, and you're going to get a signal to maintain and build more mean mass. If we're doing hypertrophy type work, body weight type work, we don't get that that nerve signal because we're not lifting heavy enough to create that stress and adaptation. Mm. So yes, you might try, you might slow down the rate of lean mass loss, but so many women who are like, I'm I'm doing resistance training and you dig in and they're still in that eight to 15 rep range and they might be doing it three times a week and they're super setting, it becomes a cardiovascular workout and it's not addressing the issue that we need to, which is we need to really stimulate the muscle fibers that we have to keep them and also signal that we need more of them. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So one of the things that I hear a lot from clients, and I, I, I hear this point because I've felt this before, is exercise being this like mental health benefit for them, you know, and, and they really like cardio, you know, that they mm-hmm. like that long duration cardiovascular type activity. Um, so there's this balance, right. That you mentioned, and you talk about, you know, really how to implement this. You even use so many case studies in your book that really actually make it much more applicable when you, when you lay it out of how you address this with certain clients, but how, how would you speak to a client, just a listener here saying, okay, you really like cardiovascular activity. Um, you like strength. You don't like strength training very much, especially doing it, you know, in those types of repetition range. What would you say to that person about how to kind of, you know, reframe how they can balance it out a little bit? Yeah, I feel like you're talking about all of my endurance friends. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I come from a massive endurance background, right? And the soul food of going out and doing a long ride or a long run is definitely that. It's your soul food. That's how you're connecting with friends. You're out in the sun. You are doing what you love. But when we're looking at from the physiological aspects, women are really designed to go long and slow. So if we keep doing that cardiovascular work, we're not ever going to get fitter. We're not going to build mass and we are going to predispose ourselves to putting on that body fat. So when I'm working with endurance focused people, cardiovascular focused people, it's like, look, I understand 100%. I come from a bike racing background, Ironman background, ultra running background. And the thing about it is as we get older, our bodies change. And if you're thinking about puberty and how everything changes for girls around puberty, and they're not retaught how to throw or run and they have body composition change, we're at the other end. So we need to reteach our bodies how to keep performing how we want them to. And it's not the long slow stuff. What we want to do is we want to look at doing two weeks of focus and one week of recovery. And that two week of focus, we want to do minimum of two, maybe three days in the gym where we're lifting heavy. And people who don't like going to the gym, it's not an hour and a half in the gym. 
we're talking 30 minutes where you're going in and you're doing three to five exercises, three to five sets, and you are having three to five minutes of recovery or rest between them. And you might go in and go, I'm doing squats and I'm doing deadlifts today. Boom, done and dusted. Then you're out the door. Or for my endurance loving friends, you do that posterior chain work and then you go to the treadmill or the bike or the rower or whatever your love is. And you're doing specific high intensity work right after the heavy lifting because that's going to teach your body to move more efficiently and to be able to run or ride better when it's tired. Mm. And then when we're looking at, okay, so that might be two or three days a week. What about the other days? A week? If we make that the bread and butter of it, and we're recovering really well between, then on the weekend, yes, there is the chance to go out for one long, slow, and when I say slow, embarrassingly slow, because you don't want to get into that moderate intensity work. And that moderate intensity where everyone tends to fall when they're doing endurance work, it's too hard to be easy and it's too easy to be hard. What happens is you end up bringing cortisol up and getting into the sympathetic drive, which is not an adaptive state that we want our bodies to be in. So I've had people who are ultra runners. I've had people who are training for 100 gravel or 100 mile gravel races. I've had people training for half and full Ironman races. And when they're like, yeah, I want to be able to be strong in the back half of my event, or I want to be strong through my training and not get injured. Then we put the emphasis on, let's look at at mobilizing and building in that resistance work, doing some plyometric work and some high intensity work. And then we're going to do micro blocks of what we need to do with that ultra endurance stuff. And they end up fitter, faster, and uninjured. So when they get to the start line, they've had the, the work that they need to do, but they've also had times within those blocks where they've had the soul food love of endurance. Mm -hmm. I love it's that. It's not one... It's not one or the other. And I think that's been one of the confusing things where people are like, I can't give it up. It's like, no, I'm not asking you to give it up. I'm saying we need to look at changing our focus because our bodies are undergoing such a change just the way young girls do when they go through puberty. So we're reteaching different stressors and we're not giving up what we love, but we're improving what we love by giving our body what it needs to keep thriving in that endurance environment. Yeah. And if you're somebody who's, you know, always been doing the same thing, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun to switch it up a little bit and challenge yourself. If you're, if you're any sort of athlete minded individual, you're going to enjoy it. Like you're going to enjoy the challenge. You might not like that it's hard um, or that it's different at first, but you know, the way that you lay it out in the book, um, my mom even has already like, she's re-inspired by reading it. She's like, okay, then I got to do my plyo plyometrics and um, you know, get my heart rate up a little bit more when I'm doing my runs instead of just doing a straight run. So, and she's having more fun with it, right? She's excited awesome. because it's not like, oh, I'm just going out for my usual run again today um, and giving you some guidelines. You know, it's almost like, you know, your own personal trainer through this book, which is so great. Awesome. Exciting. Yeah. I've, I've had to switch because, you know, I'm right in the middle of it. And um, come, like I said, I come from a long line of endurance, but I've always had strength training in the background from when I was in high school and our cross country coach made us get in the gym. So it's always been like the undercurrent of injury resistance. Mm -hmm. And, and I just kind of upped it as I've gotten older. I'm like, you know what, if I feel strong, then I know I can go run hard or I can ride hard, even if I haven't put in the training because my body's resilient. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little bit of a mind switch when you get to be in, uh, in that ultra space or in that endurance space. And you've been doing the same thing for so long. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any change for anybody is uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean it's bad. And it usually means it's good if you're uncomfortable. So, right. Exactly. Yeah. So I know you mentioned this aspect of body composition and, and I would say that when, when clients come to me, you know, athletes, they're, they're definitely complaining of this, like this belly, right? That's their biggest complaint of, okay, this is my main goal. I want to lose belly fat. Um, and so I want to start with the idea of energy availability. And you talk a lot about this in the book of low energy availability. And you alluded to this just previously when you said, most women aren't eating enough. So can we talk a little bit about that? And then, um, you know, how to even, how to notice if you're eating enough? Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of cultural aspects that lead women not to eat enough. 
So we look at the 80s and the calories in, calories out, let's do fat burning exercise, stay out of the gym, you're going to get bulky. Uh, the very masculinization of when you walk into a gym, all the men are in the resistance training area and all the women are on the cardiovascular machines. And then we have the in, influx of keto diets and intermittent fasting diets. And there's all this messaging for women to be small and to not take up that much space. But when we start looking at body composition and body composition change at this point, it's not eat less, it's actually eat more. Because we have all these messages that women are not supposed to eat that much, or if you do, then something's you know wrong. You should, and and you shouldn't really be out there enjoying so much food because of this influx of these cultural messages. And there, a lot of them are subliminal. And when you get into this time period where your body composition is changing and you are putting on belly fat, those messages kind of rear their ugly head. Even if you are like, wait, no, I eat. I'm not afraid to eat. I'm going to, and I can do this, but then your body composition starts changing and you're like, oh, wait a second, what's going on? Am I training hard enough? Am I eating too much? And unfortunately, the subconscious switch is to start falling into maybe not eating around your training or delaying food after your training or saying I'm too busy to eat or consciously trying to cut back on calories because you're like, I'm eating too much. And that old message of calories in, calories out starts to play as much as people try to profess that it doesn't because it's been so ingrained, it comes out. When we talk about low energy availability and perimenopause, our metabolisms are changing and our body's under a high stress state. So we have an elevation in the baseline level of our cortisol, as well as our hormones are changing, which are, are actually causing this body composition switch. If we are not eating enough, we are increasing the stress in our body and we are signaling to the hypothalamus that we are under nutrient stress. Where we don't have enough nutrition coming in. So then the hypothalamus, which feeds forward to appetite hormones and thyroid regulation goes, wait, we need to conserve. We need to start slowing everything down because the body's under a lot of stress. We see there's this extra cortisol and now we don't have enough food. So we really need to dial it down. So we start seeing more belly fat coming on and unfortunately, the first thing that goes is lean mass. And when we're in this perimenopause, postmenopause state, you don't want to have any signaling to lose lean mass because it's really difficult to keep and really difficult to build back. So if we're looking at what is low energy availability, it's not necessarily not eating enough in the day or over a 24 hour period, it's the timing of your food because we need to fuel for what we are doing and recover from it so that we keep cortisol low and we are also signaling to the hypothalamus that yes, there's nutrition coming in. We are fine to do this exercise stress because we have enough nutrition coming in to overcome that stress, as well as be able to maintain enough nutrient density for just maintaining health. So when I'm talking to and working with women who are in perimenopause, I'm like, we need to really knock the fasted training on the head. There, you're not gonna benefit. We know that women do better in a fed state and that is maybe 100, 150 calories, maybe 30 grams of carbohydrate for, before a cardiovascular session, 15 grams of protein before a resistance training session, but you need something in there because that drops cortisol, also signals to the hypothalamus that yes, there's some food available. Afterwards, it's really important to get food in because if you don't, you maintain this breakdown state and it's as if you haven't eaten at all, as you haven't, you've just you know, depleted yourself through exercise. And so the hypothalamus is like, okay, I need to keep breaking down lean mass because I don't have anything coming in. It's not going to body fat, it's going to lean mass. So if we're looking at really instigating body composition change, we need to support the body as it's going through this hormone shift by fueling it. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we are eating before and after training and that we are having regular protein doses at every meal. So around 30 grams at every meal and maybe 15 to 20 at every snack. And a lot of women, I'd say about 60 to 65% of recreational female athletes, regardless of age, are in low energy state. We have done some significant research um, from a kind of a global study and it's scary stats. So if we're starting to really pick out that 40 something set, there's a higher incidence 
in recreational female athletes because of the changes that they're undergoing. And they're so conscious that their body composition is changing. And it's that unfortunate messaging that if you train harder and eat less, then you're going to lose weight, which is not true. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you're here saying this because I can tell this to my clients all day, but they think like, oh no, I'm the exception. You know, my, my body it's, or like, you know, it's just, she just, she wants me to just feel better during my exercise, but not better in my body. It's like, no, this is science. This is like real yeah. true science. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it is, it is a really hard mental switch for so many people. Because if they've been in the habit of low fueling in around workouts and low fueling throughout the day, and then at night, they're like, I have a really good dinner and then I'm still a little bit hungry. So I might have a snack. Then that also interferes with sleep because mm -hmm. if you're eating too close to bed, then you interfere with sleep architecture. And so it just is this negative feedback where it's like, okay, let's, let's reassess. We need to parse food out throughout the day, especially in and around training, because we want those stress signals for adaptation not for breaking down things and making us sleep like shit. Mm -hmm. And then people are vulnerable, right? Women are vulnerable, especially in this state. And so they might think, okay, well, maybe it's not, you know, calories, maybe I need to intermittent fast or do the key, like take a dr dramatic, you know, lifestyle or dietary shift, which you've mentioned is not supported. It's, it's mostly done in males, um, this research. Yep. And I don't know about you, but I have never seen this be successful, even just anecdotally with one-on-one -on -one clients. I just haven't. No, no. And I mean, every time we post something about intermittent fasting or keto, I like prepare myself for a day of PTSD because there are so many people that are so diehard that it works, it works, it works. It's like, no, I'm posting the science about it, people. Yeah. Here are the references. If you want more, email me. I will give them to you. And when we're looking now at even more of the research that's coming out about time-restricted eating, which is calorie restriction with intermittent fasting or just plain intermittent fasting, um, we're seeing that the just plain calorie restriction, not in a time window, is so much more effective for moderating and changing body composition mm -hmm. than trying to stick to eating windows. And I mean, I get backlash of, oh, you're lumping everything in intermittent fasting, but there's so many different ways to do it. I'm like, okay, the only intermittent fasting that I will support is when you stop eating after dinner and then you eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. that, that's intermittent fasting. Okay, I'll support that 12 hour or that, you know, 11 hour fast. That's, that's but everything else is just gonna, the science is not there to support all of the changes that people are saying. Even on national radio here yesterday, they were interviewing an expert who is actually looking into aging and looking at intermittent fasting and all the things on telomere length. And he's like, I can't actually find data to support that intermittent fasting helps with the nine things we know that cause aging. It doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything to tel telomere length. It actually can perpetuate some of the aging things that we know that we can stop. So this intermittent fasting that's being transferred from worms and rats into humans is not viable, but the messaging is so strong that it is. And I was like, finally, someone else is, is out there saying it too. And he wasn't even specific to men or women. He's just saying across the board, it's not a diet trend that people should be following. I love that. Well, thank you to him and to you for all the work that you're doing because it's yes. the message is so loud and, and it's it's crazy how quickly something like that can spread with such misinformation. I know it's crazy. It's um, the globalization of I feel like it's the globalization of operator when you're a kid and used to whisper in a, in a circle, yeah. right? I feel like that's what's happened. And it, yeah. and it dramatically changes translation very quickly is what it feels like. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, so wh when we talk about this body composition, um, you know, change, and these are some things you can do with it. You can change your training. You can lift heavier weights, strategically plan out your cardiovascular training. You can optimize your diet, um, you know, especially focusing on that protein. And in the book you talk about, you know, doesn't need to be a bunch of animal protein. You can find plenty of great plant sources, which as a dietitian, you know, easy to find easy, easy to find these plant protein sources. So, you know, keeping that in mind as, you know, as a, a proponent of health, and then say somebody is just like, 
I am really struggling mentally with my body size right now. What would your advice to them be, um, you know, given this really vulnerable time for them? Yeah, and it is hard because of the social messages that we see everywhere, right? And I have people focus on something else that's not body composition or the size that they are. It's like, if we're looking at, at really instigating change, let's look at, at strength. Like you're not very good at strength. Let's look at, let's build your strength and think about how strong your body can get and what your body is doing to support. And as we start building that strength, I don't want people to be on the scale. I want people to like focus on the weight that they're, they are lifting. And then in a few weeks down the line, they're seeing changes in their body composition. So it's taking that, that holistic view and breaking it down to let's focus on one thing at a time that isn't uh, an external visual, but something that is an internal cue, like how am I feeling with what I'm lifting? Or can I hit that top, top end intensity and repeat it? How much fitter am I getting? Because again, our bodies are changing. We're not going to look like or feel like we did when we were in our 20s. And that's just the fact that we are aging. And it's as hard now as when we're looking again, I keep referring back to puberty where girls are going through puberty and having lots of body composition changes and very aware of what they look like and the messaging around it. It's finding the support and there's lots of really good um, like Facebook groups and Instagram groups and stuff like that that are really talking about it because it isn't about what you look like or the way your clothes are fitting. It's about how strong you feel and how fit you feel and are you resilient to the stress that life is throwing at you right now and we start changing that messaging then people change their mind and go I got it I am feeling stronger and when they start feeling stronger and lifting more and hitting top end their body composition follows Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. So refocusing, refocusing and, you know, spend less time on social media, like unfollow accounts that don't make you feel good. I I've had clients who they're comparing themselves to other women, their age saying, you know, why don't I look like this? Or, you know, does she, she does only cardio. She barely eats. She does. And it's like, put your blinders on, put your blinders on, stay in your lane and focus on yourself because it's, there's so much noise. Yes, absolutely. And social media is perpetuating that everyone has this great and glorious life. And we know that that is not true. Like I personally had to get out of the Twitter feeds because of different people in academia who are taking off and I have to realize, wait, I'm not full-time academia, but it's still hits home. Like I can't follow it because it makes me feel bad about myself. Yeah. Yeah. Social media is very powerful. Yeah. I love that. And thank you for being vulnerable about that because I think that's really helpful. It's like even someone who is incredibly knowledgeable, who's written multiple books on this topic, who is, you know, a clear elite athlete herself, you know, we all have our struggles and our insecurities. And, um, these are certain things that we know don't support us. So we spend less time doing them the same way that, you know, if you're, if you have a friend who's super negative, you should not be spending as much time with that friend. You know, they're a, you know, once a year type of type of friend, for example. So um, we recently got back from two and a half months of being stateside and mm -hmm. I absolutely loved it because I got to reconnect with family and everything. But um, in my travels across the States and then back to New Zealand, it hit home of how negative and how unempathetic people have become. And it's just, you know, COVID and the state of the world and recession and everything. And even like I tried to do the whole pay it forward, like buy the person in line next to me a coffee. And he just went off. He's like, I don't need you to buy me a coffee. And I was like, whoa. So I reshifted the focus. And so now I'm like, okay, I'm trying to find the positives and everything. It's like, wherever you are, there are good people. You reach out to those good people and you let them know they're good people. And then it feeds forward that positivity. And I'm like, yeah, wait, I'm back here and it's a middle of winter and I'm a summer person, but hey, all of this rain is washing away the pollen. And it's also giving me the opportunity to catch up with friends and maybe we go to the gym instead of going on a ride. They're just really trying to reframe. And I think that so many people need to reframe everything in their lives because there's just so much negativity and it's not just like how we look but it's also, what are we doing in the day? How are we interacting with people? Are those people making me feel bad about myself? Because if it is, then that feeds back to what's going on in my body right now. Sure. Yeah. There was, um, 
that I, I love that that you're, that you're doing that and that you brought that up. There was a, there's a, like a place where basically these uh, journalists go to request like experts on topics. And one of the topics that I saw was why are people so unhappy right now? Like, why are people feeling so unfulfilled? And, you know, my first thought was part of it is just gratitude, right? Is we we're in this like culture where we're constantly looking for more, where we're never satisfied with what we have. We're, we're a consumer, right? We're a consumer environment and it's so unhealthy. And so that gratitude aspect of it, that reframing, and then I love how you said, you know, tell those good people that they're good people because that might keep them in a better state of mind. And then that will kind of, you know, trickle into, you know, the other people in the population. And hopefully that will make a huge difference. Yeah, because I don't think um, people hear the good things enough. Like everyone hears the bad things, all the negative things. If something doesn't go right, then you'll you'll find out about it. But if something goes someone's way then you absolutely don't hear about it (laughs) it's like come on let's tell people the positives even even with my clients like every time we start off our meeting I say okay let's start with the positives because there if I don't it's always like well this didn't happen and this didn't happen but then all of a sudden it's like well I had three bowel movements you know in the past three days so I'm feeling really great but you don't hear that stuff first because we yeah we focus on the negatives yeah yep so positives people let's do that i sound yes. like one of those you know those old-fashioned cheerleaders let's go <laughs> but it's important like it sounds cheesy but it's really important and when you first start to do it it might feel kind of like you know hippy dippy like write down three things you're grateful for but man that can change your physiology and you know really set the tone for your entire day yep change the the stress levels bring them down activate parasympathetic Mm-hmm. and then be be happy and people good people will keep gravitating towards you which yeah, then see. feeds forward so yeah there's there a go. science to it there's a science yeah. to it perfect yeah exactly this it's is a, this is a great segue into um the topic of gut health because when you were saying this cortisol 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 which is that stress hormone um i was looking at some research you know probably like a year ago and i this will always be something that i talk about when i think about stress and the negative impact that cortisol can have on our intestinal permeability, um, what some people will refer to as leaky gut. So you talk about this in in reference to menopause and how these cortisol levels are higher. And if you're not properly fueling, then your cortisol levels are gonna be even higher. Um, But you also have a whole chapter on gut health. So could you talk a little bit more about why, especially during this time period, we should care about our gut health? Yeah, I mean, the the gut, um, research changes all the time, but the basic premise is we have such a connection of parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system to the gut. And if we're under a lot of stress, then that feeds back down to the deep gut bacteria and it changes the diversity. So if we're looking at body composition and what we need to do, we need to make sure that we are able to activate parasympathetic. So that's that rest and digest state. And then we're eating a wide variety of colorful fruit and veg so that we are able to feed the deep gut bacteria. Because what we do notice that happens in menopause with the elevated stress and the changing in the eating habits that happen is we start to see a rise in the firmicutes phyla of bacteria. And the firmicutes phyla is associated with more obesity and less lean mass. Whereas the bacteriotes phyla, which is the one that we want to encourage growth, is the one that is activated more with parasympathetic. It is associated with more lean mass, a decrease in the cereal fat, and better um, hormone and, and neural signaling to be able to help with that parasympathetic. So we're talking about what's happening in menopause. We're having the change in our ratios and we're dropping estrogen and we're under more stress and we might be in low energy availability. Yes, it, the gut does take a big hit. So if we're looking at setting aside 10 minutes a day to just be, like I do sound hippy dippy when I say that, but when you're just like, I'm just gonna sit and I'm going to see what the breeze feels like on my face, remember that. So you're just taking that moment of pause to really try to get that parasympathetic drive going. And to make sure that you're having a plethora of different types of fibrous fruit and veg to help with that bacteriotes. Because if we are under the elevated stress and we're eating processed foods and we're not taking a moment and we're eating too close to bed, then boom, that firmicutes phyla comes up. 
and we want to really downgrade that because if we downgrade it, then we have better body composition outcomes, we have better mental outcomes, and we just tend to lean more towards the adaptations that we want rather than building up the adaptations that we don't, which is that the serial fat gain, the loss of lean mass, bone mineral issues, um, mood issues, changes in dopamine and serotonin. Excellent. Well said. I don't think there's anything else I would ask about that. You really did a great job at summing it up. <laughs> <laughs> and now the details are up to you. Like how are you going to change someone's diet to make them do that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you've got some great tips in the book. You've got, you know, case studies, you have specific exercises with pictures, you know, it's, it's really a great resource that people should check out because whether you are, you know, approaching menopause or, you know, past it, then this is something that you should be thinking about and, um, you know, caring about because there are things that you can do. And, you know, as Dr. Sims has given us today, there's so many, you know, things that we can take into our own hands to improve our quality of life. Absolutely. Don't let the uh, media of menopause being the end of your life be pervasive because it's not. It, there's ways of changing the dialogue, which I hope is going to happen with this book and all the conversations that we've all been having um, because it shouldn't be a fear. It should be like, okay, I, I have the tools to be able to keep thriving and changing and being able to hit my performance potential. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Now, just to kind of end off a little bit, is there anything that you're working on now that you're really passionate about or any new research that you're excited that's coming out or yeah, anything at all? Um, I, we just finished the ISSN female athlete position stand and got it to peer review yesterday. So that's good. That's awesome. We are revamping our menopause athletes course. So I'm putting in a whole bunch of more and new science and information in case studies, if people are interested in that. And we have launched uh, micro learning. So they're small 45 to 60 minute little deep dives into topics like iron and iron supplementation and what is collagen and how to read um, protein labels, for protein supplementation. So little deep dives and things. The one we just put up was on hot and cold using the sauna and cold water immersion for health or performance. Um, yeah, so all of those things and then other research that's, you know, still looking at um, all the stuff my PhD students are doing, which is always cool, and uh, a couple other projects along the way that I can't quite talk about yet, but I'll let okay. you know. I will look forward to hearing about it. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, any other tips that you'd like to give anyone um, who's listening today before we wrap it up? Oh, gosh. I mean, the big rock always is um, listen to your body. So if you're like, hey, I can't do heavy lifting today because I'm too tired, then don't. It's not not the end of the world because it's a lifestyle change. It's not a, you know, a 16 week plan to hit menopause like you do a marathon. It's, it's a, the change in your lifestyle that will give you that performance potential as you reach 100, 105. That's great advice. Well, thank you so much for coming on again. I really appreciate it. And um, all of the work that you're continuing to do, you are changing. Honestly, just, I'm just going to say the world, you're changing the world and it's incredible. Oh. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. But you know, like I always say, it wouldn't get out there if I wasn't able to have conversations with people like you. So well, thank you. Our thank pleasure. You. I'll say our, because I know my listeners are so excited that you're here again. So thanks again, yeah. Dr. Sims. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Thanks again. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.